Rutherford scattering has been described as one of the most famous experiments of all time. There's only one problem. It wasn't a single experiment. It was many, many experiments over probably a three-year period. Um, in describing the results of that experiment about 30 years or so after uh, it had taken place, Ernest Rutherford described the results in this way, and I'm going to read it. He said, it was about as credible as if you had fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. That's a very famous quote that's in a lot of places. He didn't say it right away. He said it 25 years later. So, um, But imagine that. You fire a large shell right, at a piece of tissue paper, and rather than going through the tissue paper, it bounces back at you. What was Rutherford scattering? What was he describing? Well, we think of it as the discovery of the nucleus. And if you look at the textbooks, that's what it will say, that Rutherford discovered the nucleus. And you know, I don't know about you, but you think of uh, discoverers, explorers, I've discovered something, Eureka, there it is, okay? Well, discovering the nucleus was nothing like that. It wasn't like he found something and said, Eureka, I see it. All of the evidence for the discovery of the nucleus is indirect, was indirect at that time. And it was based on firing not 15-inch shells, as Ernest Rutherford said in his quote, but instead alpha particles, which he had just discovered. Ernest Rutherford got the Nobel Prize in 1908, not for discovering the nucleus, but for his work on radioactivity. Discovering the nucleus, which is what we think of as the most famous thing that Ernest Rutherford did, was after he got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> It, it's, it's interesting to, to consider those points. He had been studying radioactivity. He had been studying the properties in, of alpha particles. And so in discovering the nucleus, he did not set out in any way to discover anything about the atom. He was studying the properties of alpha particles. And so what did he, what did he and his co-workers do? And his co-workers were uh, two gentlemen by the name of uh, Geiger and Martzen, and you might recognize the name Geiger from Geiger Counter. Uh, so he later became famous in his own right. They shot these, um, bombarded various uh, metal foil samples with alpha particles, and they studied the directions that those alpha particles took. And again, they were trying to determine the properties of the alpha particles. And what they found was that sometimes those alpha particles, rather than going right through the metal, the very, very thin metal foil target, they basically came back to them, and that's why they called it Rutherford scattering. Um, some of them would be deflected at small angles, some at large angles, and, and a few, a very few, would come back at them. Well, it's not really feasible to study Rutherford scattering in a typical high school classroom or even a college classroom, but we can at least get some sense of the type of thinking that was important in order for that discovery to be made. And that's what we're going to do here today by shooting marbles at a hidden, unseen target. And so we're sitting on the floor here. We have a cardboard uh, a piece here. And hidden underneath it is a target. It's invisible to us, invisible to you. And we're going to shoot not alpha particles, but we're going to shoot marbles at it. And just as they, Ernest Rutherford and his co-workers looked at the scattering angles, uh, we're going to trace the path, and sometimes the marble's going to go through, sometimes it's going to come back, and sometimes who knows. So Scott and I have several marbles, and hopefully we won't lose all our marbles doing this demonstration. Um, and we're going to just roll, roll them, and we're going to trace where we think the marble is gone. Now realize, you know, we can see where it goes in, and hopefully we can see where it comes out. In terms of what it does in the middle, well, we'll just see. And so we've each got several marbles, <laughs> and we've each got a pencil, and whoa, and I've already started losing them. <laughs> we're just going to start. And the idea is to go all around, not just from one angle. So we're going to kind of start at one end and, and just do what we can here. So. Scott is left-handed, I'm right-handed. Is this going to be okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna shoot them like that <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay. And I may give some commentary, or I may not. Well, and that one's off screen, so that one's okay. And that's why I have plenty. Thank you. <laughs> and that one came back to me. Yeah. 
And that one came back to me. Oh, oh. That one okay, it. and that one was again here. <laughs> okay, and this one came back like that. And that one went off, that's, <laughs> that's fine. I'm gonna go around here, I think, at this point. Um, and I'm right-handed, so I think I'll do it like this. Oh, that went straight through, okay. One from this angle? Yeah, whatever. And that one didn't, so that one kind of went like that. Oh. Straight through? Yeah, hmm. No, no, more marbles. <laughs> Oh, that one went off that way. That one came back, so that was back there. Try this one. Straight back. <laughs> and I was holding it that time, so. Oh, that one went straight through. Now I have to tell you, we've given ourselves an easy one here to start with. I think I've got yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to do one more, or if you can do one more, can you do one yep. more right about here? I think we need to test. Yeah. Okay. So, where did you start? Right about right here. About there. Okay, and it came back. Mm -hmm. All right. You want to do a a couple more in here, or yeah. That one came back. All right, that was about here. What about like in, that was here? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll finish one right. Well, I'll take that as the corner. <laughs> okay. Actually, if we look at that, what do you notice? Well, a lot of things went straight through. Do you have a good shot on that? All right. A lot of things went straight through, whether here or here, here. And a lot of things just bounced straight back at us. A very, a once in a while, they'd bounce off at an angle. What do you think the shape is? And I told you this was an easy one. Well, I like this because basically the shape emerges in the negative, right? If there's a target underneath there, and the marble can't penetrate it, then it gets bounced back or deflected or scattered, whatever. And so we would think that our shape would be something like this, except that this one seems pretty clear and this seems pretty clear. Here we're not sure, and remember, we have to estimate where, it hit, where it's bouncing back from, right? So we think either here or possibly up to here, because some of these estimates were here and some there. And so we're thinking that it was something like that, okay? Based on the fact that basically we thought nothing penetrated in that region. Well, let's look at what the shape looks like, okay? And I'm gonna turn that over. And you can see we have a rectangle. So we were able to deduce the general dimensions of it and the shape. And as I said, this is an easy one because it's rectangular and they're all at right angles to one another. Now, I'd like to tell some, a story here, actually. Um, and I'm going to get up if that's all right. <laughs> and hopefully I'll be able to get back down again. <laughs> um, the story I'm going to tell has to do with um, experiments that you like versus experiments that your students might either like or might find useful. Um, I edited a series of books, 23 books, on um, chemistry uh, experiments and demonstrations for high school chemistry. And in doing that, we probably tested, I think there are about 300 activities in the series, and we probably tested about five times that. If there are five experiments in every book, we probably tested 15, and we chose the, the top five, usually. And when I first heard about this experiment, which was contributed by an advisory board, and I had taught for many years, my first thought was, oh, yeah, that doesn't really interest me. I, I don't know, shooting marbles at a target underneath a box, it didn't appeal to me. But fortunately, uh, we tested everything. And we had a lab technician whose job it was and who loved doing it to test everything. So she went into the lab and she started testing shapes. 
we didn't have pre-made ones at that time. She took her children's blocks. She took toys. She took bottle caps. She took Petri dishes. She took uh, anything she could find. And she would glue them underneath some cardboard. And she would make enough of them so she didn't know which was which. And then she would do this. And then she came back and she showed me basically these drawings. And I have one here that I resurrected from our files, okay? And I went, wow, that's pretty cool. And so my first sort of take home lesson on this is just because you, an experiment may not appeal to you. Now, as teachers, we need to do the things we really like, that's important. But it's important also to realize that all of the students in our classroom are going to have different styles of learning. You know, you've talked, you've, I'm sure you've heard in your education classes about visual learners and auditory learners. And of course, my favorite are the kinesthetic ones, those that need to be jumping around and active at all points. And different types of activities are going to appeal to different students. And some students will love this. Some students won't, but you have to incorporate a wide variety of different styles. This was a, a wake-up call for me because I, I just came back and I said, wow, and I've actually got a couple of these on a board here. And again, these were uh, when we wrote up this activity in the book, we included uh, basically her drawings. And if we can focus on the easel here, and again, you can see that we're not always 100% correct, but uh, we had here a triangular shaped, uh, it looks like an isosceles triangle, although don't quote me on that one. <laughs> and you can see that sometimes they'd go off at a path, you'd think they might nick a corner and they'd go, go off on the side. Here, if you have a straight edge, those are always easy to determine. We didn't quite get the overall size here. I mean, we sort of did because something obviously went through here, but this is where you're estimating. But that's part of the scientific method. Again, what did we say at the very beginning? Rutherford didn't have direct evidence for the nucleus. What he had was indirect evidence and the assumptions that he made based on those. And what we did here, obviously the person drew these, drew the pencil uh, paths just as we did, and then afterwards, we drew in what the actual shape had been. So obviously those shapes that are in bold and gray inside were not known. Those we drew in afterwards. And so if you got a good uh, angle of that, let's go ahead and look at two others uh, that she did. You can see that uh, some of them are easy to do. And I remember somebody saying, well, that can't be the shape because look, we've got lines drawn in here. And I said, yes, but that was what she thought. Remember, she couldn't see. She was just guessing. Well, it seemed to hit there and come off at another angle. And you can see that you don't do, you know, 10 marble shoots. You probably do, I'm going to say, somewhere between 20 and 50 for each. And, and if I were using this in the classroom, that's what I would uh, encourage students to do. So you can see that in all cases, they actually, the shape, as we said, emerged in the negative. Now, this is obviously a model for the discovery of the nucleus. It does teach the scientific method, but it also talks, teaches something very important. It teaches what is the nature of evidence. In science, do we always have that eureka moment? Aha, uh -huh, we've uncovered the rock, and there it is. I've discovered something. Or do we get various clues? evidence, pieces of evidence, and we have to put that evidence together to come up with a model. So that's another take-home lesson for this activity. I think another take-home lesson for this activity has to do with the inherent limitations of any model. You know, we teach about models in chemistry. We use models for everything. One of my favorite uh, uh, sort of little vignettes that I heard about teaching in terms of telling st teaching students about the nature of a model is a teacher holding up a, in this case, it was an inflatable globe, okay? Basically, you know, like a, a beach ball, but a globe. And the teacher says to the students, is this the earth? And the students say, yes, that's the earth. Is this the earth? Yes, there it is. I see the oceans, I see the continents. There's the north, that's the Earth. No, that's a model for the Earth. And when we're teaching chemistry, we use so many models, starting with, of course, the atomic model. Is the atomic, is the atom still a model? Well, it certainly was at the time of Rutherford. Do we have 
direct evidence for every part of the atomic model, or are there still some parts of it? Maybe when you get to quarks, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as a chemist, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that's all I need. The physicists, they got quarks. I'm like, mm, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, quarks make up the protons and the neutrons. The point is, it's a model. Every model has its strong points. A model is only as good as the underlying assumptions, and you need to understand what those assumptions are. What are, and if I were also using this in my class, I would make sure I come full circle at the end. I studied the nucleus today. Okay, you studied a model of the nucleus. What was, you have to be really concrete at the end when you wrap up. What was, if you compare Rutherford's experiment and the experiments that we did here, what was the marble a model for? The marble was a model for the alpha particles. What was the shape a model for? It was a model for the nucleus. And you could talk about other things as well. Um, I think this is a great activity. I think it says something that when I first looked at this activity before having done it, I wasn't that impressed with it. It was only after seeing it and after seeing other people doing it that I became, uh, if you will, a true believer. I'm just going to show you some of the other shapes that we have. We, uh, in, you can make them with anything. We've, of course, got a circular one. Is this a good place to, to lift them? So you can see them. And I'm just going to lift these up one at a time and kind of show you. You can use anything. Uh, here we've got basically a square set on edge. So we've got the diamond, which I think was one of the ones we looked at. And you can make them more complicated. Here we've got, this one would be a really difficult one to see, um, that kind of right triangle, kind of an acute uh, angle there on the side. That would, would be really hard, I think, to figure out what that one was. Here we have the, uh, the semicircle or half circle. And just some other ones here. We've got a, a rhombus. That one you give to the students that, you know, they know everything. This, this is the group that always comes up with the answer before anybody else. Fine, you give them the trapezoid. <laughs> They're going to be there for a while. And here we had our, uh, I think, our isosceles triangle. So uh, this is our model for Rutherford scattering. We call it atomic target practice. Thank you.